Um, and I forgot to put the millions on these stats, but basically what it means is, is that by, by about 2011 or 2012, I think what I did before that, um, in terms of the, what they call the, the highest portion of people speaking language on the net, is going to switch to Chinese. So Chinese will take English in about 2011 and 2012 um, as, as, as the primary language that's been spoken. And, and that, that has some major, major implications for, for anyone who's operating on a global platform. So any company or any organisation that, that needs to interact with people around the world can't get away from the fact that they actually need to, to consider a multilingual strategy. So, and I'll, I'll go through in a second why, but, but um, that has some, is, is causing some major headaches for some pretty big organisations around the world, I can tell you right now. Um, the other part, and this is what we got into, is, is access. So, the big challenge that you've got in content, and we'll kind of get into technology a little bit, but you've now got, historically, you know, there was maybe three or four little people down here creating content, pushing it out. You've now got a much wider distribution platform of people who are generating the content. You've got to work out how to deliver that information, so you've got to have some technology through the middle section that actually takes that content, pushes it out, and you've got to go deliver it across different platforms. So even two or three years ago, you know, maybe 10% of our clients would, would uh, were concerned about having a, a mobile interface to the website. I'd say 60, 70% now do. Um, and likewise, you know, even up to two or three years ago, or two years ago, most clients were happy enough for you just to to code up their website to run in IE6 and 7, and now you have to do it by Fox and Safari because thankfully IE is losing its dominance. Um, and you've got what we call third generation technologies like uh, Adobe Air and uh, Silverlight that, that are generating desktop applications so that people are now actually downloading the content from one locally, but are still syncing back to web servers. So, there's, there's some major cost implications about how you do this and, and doing it right. If you get it wrong, it can cost you well into the seven figures to, to fix it up. Does that make sense so far? Yep. Um, and this is the other one, and this is where we get into um, mobile technology. So the big challenge that, that particularly organisations are facing is, is that this is the estimations on um, 3G and 4G access by 2030. So, but 3G access is about 300 to 350 kilobytes a second. 4G is about 10 millisecond. Um, so again, it's the equivalent of going from dial to broadband. And, and you've got networks in, in uh, and this is where, if you like, the developing economies of, say, India, for example, have a major advantage because they don't have any legacy platforms. So they're actually running a 4G network because they started from scratch about five years ago and built, built it that way. So. Um, and they've got lots of spectrum. So what, what it means is, is that you've got this massive audience in, in Asia, and you're talking about 60, 65% penetration or, or rate in, into Asia. That is a huge audience that, 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 are, that are primarily consuming content through their web. So we're talking about Japan and Korea, we're talking about India, China, um, Southeast Asian rate regions. They are, they're going to be consuming content primarily through, through the web browser. So, I mean, the estimate through the mobile browser. So, I think the estimates in India, for example, are that there's, you know, at the moment there's 20 or 30 million people with a broadband connection and about 200 million with a 3G phone access, and they expect that to go to 400, 500 million in a couple of years. So, if you're a company and you're looking at multi-language and you don't have a web, uh, a mobile strategy and you need to go to those markets, you, you're gone. You, you can't, you literally can't access those markets. And there's a, um, there's a, there's a great, um, there's a great reason. This is we're going to kind of divert into geopolitical practice for a second. Um, there's, a, there's a reason why what's happened in the world in the last year and a half has, has massively accelerated what's going on. So historically, if you if you imagine, and you all know this, China and India and Southeast Asia and Asian regions, so they 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 produce lots of goods and they trade them over here. And that's what's been happening for the last five or six years. What's happening now, and what needs to happen has been accelerated over the next five or six years, is going to be the reverse impact. So you've got, these numbers here are basically the growth between now, I think it's 2018, in what, what they term the middle class. So a middle class in India and China, by 20, will have the same purchasing power as the middle class in the States in terms of disposable income. 
So all of a sudden, you've got this huge growth in, in domestic demand, which means, and this is where the US government is now fighting trade wars, is they recognise the only way the US is going to trade themselves out of debt is to basically start selling lots of stuff over here. And to do that, it means that all of a sudden, all these guys in the US and Europe have to talk to these guys in the local language because there's a great comment that uh, the German Chancellor made a few years ago which was along the lines of, if I'm selling to you, I speak your language. If, or, uh, if you're selling to me, you speak my language. If I'm selling to you, I'm going to speak your language. So, you've got all these US companies, of which there's lots and lots, lots of them, hundreds of thousands, who have never had to grapple with the issue of how do I, how do I sell into a market that doesn't speak my language and is half around the world and all these different factors. So, if we go back to all of the different components around multi-language content, you can see where the challenge is coming from. If, if you're more in, in the US and Europe now, you've got all of these organisations in this, this medium and small enterprise area who, who haven't even thought about globalising and are now being forced to do it. So the other thing the US government's doing is, is at the back door is putting a lot of money into a bit like Enterprise Island does here, they're putting a lot of money into companies to try and can get them to trade the cost because they recognise the only way they're going to trade themselves out of the, the debt position is to sell into the, the middle market. But the problem is <coughs> that for, for these companies, it's all about content flow. So we're going to get into some of the technology now, what this means. So, what most web content management platforms and content management systems do is they have a source language, which in this case we'll call Spanish, and content gets created in that language and you push out. And that's actually not very difficult to manage. So everyone has to create it in Spanish and then you, you push it out to the different platforms. The problem is that for, for, for multi-language to work on the web, you can't do that. You've got to run what we call a parallel model, which means that, that every person in every language can be a content creator and a con content consumer. To do that massively complicates the whole process. And we had to spend about one and a half million dollars um, five years ago to completely rebuild the product because we used to do source out and it doesn't work. It, it's fine for a 50 page website, but it's not fine for a thousand page website in, in 10 languages. Um, the other part that you need to do, and I'll happily have this argument with anybody, is on the web if you do not have a machine translation and translation memory component, you can't win. There is no way anybody except some of the major corporates can afford to run a web content management platform with lots of translation workflow at 10 cents a word or whatever they pay, which is around that figure. So if you do not have a machine translation and memory component in the system, you won't do it. So what happens is a lot of companies start off and they think it's a great idea and they do a one-off big translation and then they realise it's going to cost them about a million dollars a year or five hundred thousand dollars a year to continue to translate in five languages, and they stop. The content's old in three months, and it has implications for them around lots of areas. But you also you do need a human overlay. So we all know the problem with machine translation is it's not accurate, and it doesn't matter how much you train the system, you can never get it to one hundred percent. At least I've never seen it. So. Um, I mean, you can buy commercial tool sets like Language Weaver that will cost you 30 or 40,000 euros per language pair, um, but even with those systems, you, you still need a human overlay to correct the mistakes and clean it up. So, now what you've got to do is have someone who creates the content, you've got to push into some sort of translation framework, and then you've got to use uh, some sort of external or internal human translation overlay to correct the content and publish it. Yeah? When you talk about that uh, human machine translation and human translation, are you talking about something like Trevor or something less sophisticated? Yeah, this is where, this, this, this is what we, this is where we made a, a fundamental mistake that, that cost us a lot of money and we had to, uh, so what we did was we recognised that you needed to, our, our original plan, and, I, and I'll show you with the platform how we sold it, but our original plan was that, that we we pushed the content out. So when someone created a new uh, web page or a new piece of content on the website, they'd create a job and we'd push that job out to trials or across and we had an integration with both of those tool sets. But the problem on the web, it comes back to that speed and volume comment, is, is what we found was that, that